Please be seated. The court is now in session. For the proceeding this morning, we will hear the testimony of a witness, that is Mr. Sidney Scanberg, via a video link from New York, the United States. And for the afternoon session, we will hear the testimony of an, ex an expert, that is TCE number 12. Mrs. Sakoboti, could you report the attendance of the parties and individuals to today's proceeding? Sakoboti, Mr. President, for today's proceeding, all parties are present. As for Nuji, he is in the holding cell downstairs. Based on the decision of the trial chamber in regards to his health, for today's schedule, we will hear the testimony of two experts. In the morning, it will be TCW624 via a video link from the United States. This witness confirms to his best ability and knowledge he has no relationship by blood or by law to any of the two accused or any of the civil parties recognized in this case. This witness will take an oath before the court prior to giving the testimony. The video link has been established and the witness is ready to testify. For this afternoon session, we will hear TCE 12. This expert confirms to his best ability and knowledge he has no relationship by blood or by law to any of the two accused or any of the civil parties recognized in this case. This expert will take an oath this morning. We also have a reserve witness for today's proceeding, that is TCW665. Thank you. President, thank you, Ms. Sakobuti. Good morning, Mr. Sidney Schoenberg. This is, this is Sidney Schoenberg. Good morning to you. Thank you, Mr. Schoenberg. How old are you this year? Pardon? You repeat that? How old are you? I'm 79 years old. Thank you. Where is your current residence? My current residence is the, uh, the town of New Paltz in upstate New York. Thank you. And what is your current occupation? Well, I'm uh, self-employed. I'm, st I'm still writing articles and uh, books and uh, um, on various subjects. Thank you. Are you married? If so, what is your wife's name? And how many children do you have? Uh, my wife's name is Jane, Jane Fryman, and my, I have two daughters, Jessica and Rebecca, and three grandchildren. Thank you. 
And uh, what is your nationality? I'm an American citizen. Thank you, Mr. Sini Schenberg. As a witness to testify before this court, the trial chambers of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia require you to make an oath or take an affirmation based on your religion. Do you consent to it? Yes. I prefer the uh, affirmation, yes. Thank you. The Gretchen Miriam, could you please lead the witness to take an oath based on his confirmation? Affirmation. Dear Mr. Witness, could you please repeat after me? I solemnly declare that I will speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I solemnly declare that I will tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr. Sini Schoenberg, based on the report by the Grafie, that through your best knowledge you have no relationship by blood or by law to any of the civil parties in this case, nor to any of the two accused, namely Nu Chi and Kiel Simpon. Is this information correct? Yes, it is correct, Your Honor. Thank you. We would like now to inform you of your rights and obligation as a witness to testify before this court. As a witness before this court, you may refuse to respond to any question or request for comments that would incriminate you. That is your right against self-incrimination. And as a witness, you must testify. And in your testimony, you must respond to all the questions put to you by the judges of the bench or the parties. And you must tell the truth that you have heard, have recalled, have experienced, or observed personally of the events related to the questions put to you. Do you understand of your right and obligation as a witness? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Sini Skenberg, have you been interviewed by the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges in the past few years? You mean, have I been interviewed by judges uh, on your court? Yes, that is correct by the ECCC judges. Have you been interviewed? No, not, not until now. Thank you. And we would like to inform Nguyen Chi's defense that for the proceeding of hearing the testimony of this witness, the floor is given to Nguyen Chi's defense first to question this witness. And the time allocation is for one session. And after that, the floor will be given to the prosecution and the lead co-lawyers. You may proceed. Um, Mr. President, I, 
Good morning. I think there's a misunderstanding. Um, we were under the impression that the prosecution would start. That's how it was notified to us. Confirmation, confirmation of that fact uh, I received yesterday from the Greffier. I saw my learned friend on the other side not, so it's also their impression that they will start because this witness is also on the list of the prosecution. Um, so that would be my suggestion to the team. President, if parties agree with the uh, proceeding as you just rest, then the floor is given to the prosecution to put the questions to this witness before other parties. And for the prosecution and for the lead co-lawyers, the combined time is two sessions. Good morning, Mr. President, and good morning, Your Honors, and good morning, everyone in and around the courtroom. Good morning, Mr. Schoenberg. My name is Wayne Hood. And together with my international colleague, that is Tariq Abdul Haq, I will be putting a number of questions to you on behalf of the Office of the Co Prosecutors. I will ask you about the evacuation of Phnom Penh on the 17th, April 1975. And my colleague, We'll be asking you about other events that you witnessed during the time. I'm going to read to you a brief excerpt from your diary, which has been allocated document number E236-1-4-3.1. It is entitled Cambodia Diary, 1975. A journalist day by day notes on the fall of Cambodia through the Khmer Rouge. The passage is at page 71, and the English EN is 00898279, and it describes what you saw at around 5 p.m on 17 April 1975, and I will first read it and then ask you a few questions. Quote, we head for the hotel, and now we see for the first time clearly the forced evacuation. Teams of insurgent soldiers waving pistols and rifles, some shouting and some using bullhorns, were ordering people to leave their homes instantly and head for the countryside. People were told they would be given instructions where to when they got out of the city. When a family moved slowly for the insurgents, twist, the rebels fired shots in the air to demonstrate they meant business. The streets were filling with loaded rickshaws and cars and people on foot as the exodus gathered momentum, and there were the thousands of wounded from the hospitals. Some limping, some on crutches, including amputees, and some being pushed by relatives 
in barrels and wheelchairs and on their very hospital beds with plasma bottles still attached to their arms. End of quote. Here is my first question to you. Can you tell the court first where exactly did you see these people? saw them in several uh, places in the city. The first uh, was at a hospital named the Preya Ketmelia Hospital. The doctors hadn't come in because of the, uh, the, the uh, Khmer Rouge invasion, but there were nurses but only nurses, and there wasn't much medicine. And people were bringing in wounded relatives, and some of them were dying on the tile floor, and blood was dripping down the uh, steps. And when uh, our little group uh, came out of the hospital, we were uh, arrested and put in, in, uh, in a, uh, a tank-like structure, a, a truck, uh, and we were driven to uh, a place by the Mekong River where uh, their officers were having lunch. <coughs> we came out of this uh, vehicle, and we were facing, uh, as we came out, we were facing men uh, with guns at their hips pointed at us. Uh, but your question goes to, uh, we were not killed, and that is another story, but the question is that on the way, we saw people leaving, and we saw uh, people on being pushed on uh, uh, beds and, and all kinds of things uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with bottles of serum uh, hanging from the bed and they were all being forced out of the city. And uh, the avenue that uh, we came out on uh, was scattered with the shoes and, and, and sandals that people had lost as they were forced to run, walk quickly uh, in these huge crowds. So I saw it in many parts of the city. Uh, I, does that answer uh, so question? Prosecutor interrupts. Allow me to interrupt you, Mr. Shenberg. I have uh, some more questions for you due to the time limitation located to us. I now ask you the question regarding your observation of the events. How long did you observe this for? for the rest of the day, uh, which ended with my taking refuge at the French embassy, and along with a lot of other uh, reporters and ordinary Cambodians who came over the wall. Uh, but all through the day, you saw these crowds of people being taken, 
dr driven uh, out of the city, not driven in cars, but driven like you drive cows and uh, being told that to hurry up and leave because the Americans were going to come and bomb the city. So there was a, uh, an air of panic and fear. Thank you. Now I move on to my next question. Please uh, make your response brief. You just told the court the chaotic and suffering situation of those who were evacuated uh, and those who left the hospital and you observed the event for the rest of the day. Can you tell the court approximately how many people did you see at a time? Several hundred at a time. Uh, they, f they filled the streets from one side to the other. From, you know, uh, just, it was... Uh, Prosecutor interrupts us. Thank you. Upon seeing those people filling uh, the street, were they young or old, and did they include men, women, or children? Yes, women, children. Uh, all kinds of people. Okay. Thank you. Were they were the evacuees civilians or were they military or a mixture of both? Most of them were civilians and some were men who had uh, taken off their uniforms and were being taken out of the city. Thank you. In the passage that I just read, you stated there were teams of insurgent soldiers waving pistols and rifles and shooting in the air. Could you describe how many teams you saw and how many soldiers were in each team? Uh, I saw them f firing their rifles in the air and uh, let's say two or three places in the city. Uh, they were celebrating. In the same passage, can you describe what you meant by insurgent soldiers? Which military group did they belong to? As far as I could tell, all of them uh, belonged to the Khmer Rouge army and wore the uniforms of that army. Thank you. When people were forced to evacuate and fill the road, did you notice whether there were any Khmer Rouge officers present? Yes. 
there were com there were uh, Khmer Rouge officers uh, when we were taken uh, from the hospital to that spot on the Mekong River. There were several officers, uh, lieutenants or captains. They didn't have their, uh, their they didn't have the, how should I put it, uh, names on their uniforms, but they were the officers. In the passage that I read, you say there were thousands of people coming from the hospitals, including amputees, and some being pushed in barrels, wheelchairs, and hospital beds. I saw all that. When you observed those people coming from the hospitals, did you observe whether any medical assistance was being provided to these evacuees? I saw no m medical uh, care being given by any doctors or nurses. And in one instance, uh, they were told they were being taken to a uh, in a hospital uh, on a road south of Phnom Penh. But I had visited that hospital several times. It was a mental institution, only one doctor, and absolutely uh, no modern uh, uh, ways to deal with uh, wounds that these people had, the victims that came out of the hospital. And so that was, there was no, that hospital could not have handled that group. Thank you. ខ្ញុំនឹងបន្តសំនួរនៅពេលដែលនៅពេលដែលទាហានខ្មែរក៏ហំបានផ្ដល់ការបានបញ្ជូនប្រជាជនឬក៏ជំលៀសប្រជា
Do you know anything about what happened to those who were too sick to continue their journey? Uh, I, can, I can only guess, uh, but two weeks later, when we were being taken out of Phnom Penh, uh, there were bodies along the roads that they were uh, forced to leave. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming that some of them were people who died uh, on the way out of the city. I have uh, only a few more questions for you. During this period, as far as you could see and hear, did the Khmer Rouge uh, give any reason for the evacuation to the people who were being forced out? Earlier on, you said that the Khmer Rouge uh, said uh, that uh, the American bombardment was uh, imminent. So could you please elaborate on this point? Uh, I heard about that uh, from others who had witnessed it. I myself never heard anybody say that the uh, Americans uh, were coming to bomb, and they weren't. It, w it was not true. Uh, on this uh, point, I would like to ask you for a bit of clarification concerning the um, statement that you say that it was not true. Uh, was it uh, what the people said that was not true or uh, because uh, there was no American bombardment afterwards? No, I mean, I'm saying that what the, uh, what the people were told was not true. And since I and many others stayed at the French embassy for two weeks, uh, no bombing occurred. Thank you, Mr. Skenberg. I have one last question for you. Following the uh, 17th of April 1975, after one day of observation, uh, on the uh, subsequent day, uh, did you continue to see any evacuees leaving the city in the days that followed? Uh, no. I, I saw what might have been a few stragglers, but essentially almost the entire population of over two million were taken out of the city on that first day. Thank you, Mr. Skenberg, for enlightening us. I do not have uh, any further question for you, but my esteemed colleague, Mr. Uh, Tariq Abdul Haq, uh, will have a few more questions concerning uh, the events uh, that uh, relates to uh, what I have asked you. Thank you, Mr. Skenberg. The Skenberg, the President, thank you. Uh, the International Co-Prosecutor, you may proceed.
good morning, and I guess it's good evening where you are, Mr. Schamberg. As you heard, my name is Tariq Abdul Haq. I am a member of the prosecution team, and I'll be asking you some more questions about the events uh, in April 1975 that you witnessed in and around Phnom Penh. If I can start just by revisiting some of the uh, statements you just made and uh, see if we can elaborate on those a little bit further. You just told my colleague that the claim that American bombing was imminent was not true. And of course that no bombing occurred as you were able to, to witness. Can I ask you, going back in time, perhaps a few days or a couple of weeks before the fall of Phnom Penh, as a, as a journalist covering the events in the country, did you come across any reports or indications that an American bombing would follow in the event of the fall of Phnom Penh? no uh, information indicating that the Americans were planning a bombing. The American bombing, uh, which began in uh, 1970, uh, was cut off uh, in 1973. I believe it was in July or August, and uh, there was no bombing after that, uh, at least no bombing that I observed uh, or, or heard from other sources. Thank you. If I can move on to another uh, issue you have discussed with my colleague. And this relates to the uh, insurgent forces that you saw uh, firing guns into the air. You, you, you said that uh, some of the soldiers were celebrating, um, but I also just want to return to the specific passage that was read, and that indicates that uh, when a family moved too slowly, for the insurgents' taste. The rebels fired shots in the air to demonstrate they meant business. Is, is that right? Were fi fired shots in order to uh, indicate to the population that the Khmer Rouge meant business? Yes, I saw that. And it was, it was clear that they were trying to get them out of their houses and get them on the road quickly. And it worked. Thank you. We may well come back to uh, uh, some of these descriptions as we go along. Uh, and before I leave uh, for the moment, uh, the 17th of April, if I can just touch on one more uh, answer that you gave to my colleague in relation to what you described as one instance where patients were told they were being taken to a hospital south of Phnom Penh. Am I correct in understanding that that was one instance you heard? In other words, it was, uh, if I understand correctly, it wasn't an organized effort for all patients to be transported to a hospital. Uh, no, not all people. But uh, I remember seeing a report afterward uh, from an American who says he was there, uh, who said that they were taken there and that it was a, 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 uh, an active hospital. And I knew who this man was, and he was telling us that this was simply an agrarian revolution 
and uh, a new future for Cambodia. And I, uh, and I don't know from what he wrote if he ever paid any visit or even saw that hospital at any time in his life. So I am, I, my comment was that even if that string of people being driven into the, down into the south uh, could never have been handled by such a decrepit hospital which was not there for those kind of wounds. And, and did you see uh, the injured, the sick people that were evacuated from the hospitals, did you see them moving in other directions apart from heading south? Yes. All the directions out of the city. Uh, I forget them. That may have been Route 4, but uh, that, that went south. The uh, Route 5 was built, and uh, I saw those uh, thousands and thousands of people going up Route 5 toward Siem Reap. Uh, thank you. Um, I I'll leave uh, these images for the moment, and uh, by way of setting a context to the rest of the events on and around the 17th of April. I'd like to ask you a, a short list of questions about the situation in Phnom Penh in the weeks and months preceding the fall of the city. And I'm going to be referring primarily to your diary from which my colleague read earlier. So for the record, Your Honours, this is document E236-1-4-3.1-2-3-4-5-6-7-8-9-10-11-12-13-14-15-16-17-18-19-20-21-22-23-24-25-26-27-28-29-30-31-32-33-34-35-36-37-38-39-40-41-42-43-44-45-46
uh, need. And at that time, uh, in January, and all through the country until it fell to the Khmer Rouge, uh, on April 17th, uh, you would see on the roads and in backyards children with red hair, children with bellies, all of it meaning very, very, or some other form of starving. And, uh, and there, there uh, was a great, great need for oil, for example, to keep the electricity on. And eventually, the, uh, elect they only had enough fuel at the end to keep the lights on for maybe a, uh, an hour or two, wherever you live. Thank you. If I can, if I can interrupt there. Um, in that passage that we looked at, uh, you said that the, the convoy took fire almost immediately, and that once arrived, the ships had rocket and shell damage. Uh, were you able to uh, ascertain from your interviews and observations who it was that fired on these convoys? Uh, all, of, all of the people who reported about it, or interviewed about it, uh, said it was the Khmer Rouge. It wasn't the Vietnamese, and uh, and the uniforms are different, and, uh, and I had no reason to doubt uh, what they were telling me. Just going to look at one other brief um, uh, description of this that you give. Um, this is from a different document. Document. It's one of the documents that we sent you uh, with the court's permission. Uh, it's a book called The Killing Fields, The Facts Behind the Film. It was first published in 1984, uh, and the document number is E243.2. And what I'm particularly interested in is a, a newspaper article that is reproduced in, in this book. Uh, and if you look at that, it is at page 38. The article is entitled, Battle for Mekong River, Critical from Phnom, for Phnom Penh. Uh, Mr. President, with your permission, we can show that on the screen. The President, you may proceed. Mr. Schamberg, the copy may not be very clear, so I will read the, the particular passages that we're interested in. This is at page 38, and the English ERN is 00862586. We don't have a, a Khmer or French translation at the moment. And as I said, it's entitled Battle for Mekong River, Critical for Phnom Penh. It's a New York Times article dated the 9th of February, 1975, authored by you. So just a, a short passage of interest. Quote, the Cambodian insurgents, by laying mines in the Mekong for the first time and by digging in, digging in with heavy guns along the river banks, have sunk 19 supply vessels in the last 10 days and for the moment have effectively halted traffic on the river. Is that right, uh, Mr. Schamburg? And if you can expand uh, on these on these findings, um, that a total of 19 supply vessels had been sunk over a 10-day period, 10 day period uh, effectively halting traffic on the river. Um, those uh, that information came from the few uh, boats that got through. And their, 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 uh, their crews 
and uh, I had no reason to, to doubt it because we, we knew from other sources how many had left Saigon and come up the Mekong River or tried to. Uh, and the situation at, at that point was getting very grim and eventually the, uh, the, the Mekong was so blocked that, that no one uh, would get on a boat. No, no merchant marine or anybody would get on a boat to try to reach uh, Phnom Penh and, uh, and at the very end uh, American planes relief planes were dropping food and munitions uh, from the sky in airplanes so the Mekong was a critical supply line and uh, and at that point, the the government, the Lan Nau government in Cambodia, uh, could not hold back the uh, Khmer Rouge. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can ask you, just as a follow-up to that question, with the convoys stopping and the airlift beginning. During those, those months preceding the fall of the city, to the best of your knowledge, were there any attempts being made by the Khmer Rouge to facilitate or enable the delivery of humanitarian aid into the city to relieve the sort of situation that, you, that you've been describing? quite the opposite. The Khmer Rouge, from, we learned from people in rural areas, were always trying to, to uh, get people to join them. They were looking to build you know, their war machine, and uh, they had no instincts about bringing in food for people who weren't part of their machine. And that's what I found when I went out into the areas uh, where they would appear at night and at other times. Thank you. We, we'll get to those additional details in, in a moment. Um, just another aspect as, as we move quickly through these um, weeks and months preceding the fall of the city. So another aspect uh, that is of some interest is the the shelling of the city that you describe in your diary uh, and also in other uh, articles that you authored at the time. There's quite a few examples, so I'm going to uh, select perhaps just, just one or two and see if you can expand on that for us. On page 13 of the diary is an entry for the 6th of February, and this is English ERN 00898221. You say the following, quote, just before 10 a.m., a rocket screams down loudly in the center of Phnom Penh. It explodes directly on a crowded school, a private elementary school for well-to-do children. The scene is another of the capital's continuing horror stories. Mangled children writhing in pools of blood on the classroom floor, still alive, but probably not for long. The next paragraph, at least 10 children are killed immediately and another 25 or 30 are wounded. 
and I'll stop there. Uh, can I ask you to describe for us whether this was a frequent occurrence, um, a shelling of what appear to be uh, civilian uh, targets or civilian buildings in Phnom Penh in that period, February, March, April 75. Yes, these, these were Chinese-made rockets. Uh, the uh, Khmer Rouge uh, used them on make, make do uh, uh, pieces of wood together. They didn't have any real way of, of uh, any, any real machine way to get them in the air. And they would go into the air, and any, any, uh, they couldn't be directed in any way to any particular target. So the weapon became um, a morale killer. And it just, it fell down here, there, and everywhere. In fact, uh, it, one of them came down uh, just outside the hotel where I stayed. And uh, it strewed shrapnel and uh, other metal bits, and people lost their legs, and a lot of them lost their lives. Uh, and, and it never stopped. It never stopped. And it, it didn't uh, even, it, they were still, they were shelling uh, on the day when the American embassy uh, evacuated. Thank you. And just continuing on from that, uh, and your description of the shells that were being used, if I can go now to page 20 of your uh, diary, English ERN 00898228, where you're describing events in early March, uh, leading up to the 5th of March. A couple of passages here uh, of interest. First, quote, a rocket lands on the capital's busiest downtown street in front of the Monorong Hotel. Five people are killed immediately and eight others lie wounded. The street is strewn with bodies and pieces of bodies. Such slaughterhouses spectacles have become everyday scenes here, brutalizing everyone's sensibilities. A little bit further down on the same page, under March 5, you say the following. Insurgents use artillery fire on the airport for the first time. Until now, they have used, they had used only their less accurate rockets. Can I ask you to the, expand on, on what you observe to be more accurate artillery fire that was being directed at the airport? They were using uh, mortars The President, uh, Mr. Witness, please hold on. Uh, there is an objection by the National uh, Defense Council for Mr. Kyosun Pond. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to make my observation regarding the method of putting questions to the witness by the international prosecutor. The time is, the session has been taken for more than one hour and the questions put to this witness is out of the jurisdiction of this court. The questions focus mainly on the events prior to 1975 that is beyond the temporal jurisdiction of this court. For that reason, it doesn't carry much interest for this court to consider. Thank you. 
if I can respond, Mr. President. Uh, we submit this objection is entirely unfounded. The court has heard months of evidence on events preceding the 17th of April 1975, most recently from, from the expert witness, Philip Short. Uh, these events are clearly relevant. They establish a context uh, and they, and they uh, assist in ascertaining the truth uh, with respect to the Khmer Rouge policies towards the people in Phnom Penh. But also, uh, I would remind the court that both accused have effectively argued that the evacuation of Phnom Penh was a humanitarian effort, that it was entirely justified and not unlawful. In that context, it is of direct relevance to look into their disposition towards people in Phnom Penh and the suffering that was being inflicted by people under their command in the weeks and days preceding the fall of the city. President, the chamber dismissed the observation by the National Council for Kills and Pond, as we need to hear the evidence regarding the facts before us for our consideration. And Mr. Witness, if you still recall, please respond to the last question put to you by the international prosecutor. Mr. Schamberg, would you like me to repeat the question? Um, simply related to what you described as of March the 5th, as the use of more accurate artillery fire on the airport. I was asking you to expand on that for us, if you could. Well, if they were getting closer and, and uh, using uh, more uh, let's say, a more advanced weaponry, uh, that would put, uh, begin to put a cloud over the use of the airport. Uh, and th that was a place where sometimes some supplies came in. Uh, and so all, it, it, would, it seemed that all of the, the places that were that, that Cambodia was connected to the things where they they, they bought things that they, they needed during this uh, attack uh, was very significant because it was just another negative uh, uh, event and and uh, it, and it, it was it was uh, it was it was uh, continued to the end. Uh, the Phnom Penh became, uh, a, you know, a prison. It had been a million people lived in Phnom Penh before the war, and another mi million and more had come to Phnom Penh f had fled the uh, Khmer Rouge assault and uh, they were now uh, prisoners. Thank you. 
just one or two more questions before we leave this, uh, this period. Um, Entry for March the 7th at page 23, English ERN 00898231. And if I can ask you to be brief on this, I'll read you the passage and ask you to uh, expand for us. Quote, shelling of the airport continues. Airlift supply planes for protection are unloading deeper into the military section of the airport. Shells fall only when these planes are on the ground, which means the insurgents must have a forward observer. If I understand that passage correctly, you seem to be suggesting that the Khmer Rouge are targeting these supply planes when they land. Am I correct in that? And if you could explain for us, please. You are correct. Excuse me. And, and, and that Sounds like President, uh, Mr. Witness, please uh, wait. Defense Council for Noon Chi, you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I've been uh, listening to the questions of my learned friend for a while, um, but I feel it's now time to object to uh, his way of phrasing the questions. Um, I know we are walking a thin line, but we must not forget that um, Mr. Schamberg is here testifying as a witness. Now, um, of course, uh, Mr. Schamberg is also a journalist and he has written books and articles uh, on, on the subject, but he's clearly not today here as an expert. So I think we should uh, uh, limit ourselves while questioning Mr. Schaumburg to the things that he has seen or has observed himself, or if he has written something, whether his sources uh, are reliable, yes or no. But to ask uh, or to invite Mr. Schaumburg to speculate about motives of the Khmer Rouge or methods of the Khmer Rouge um, is beyond uh, his position here today as a witness. Mr. Schaumburg is not, uh, like Mr. Short, an expert and we should not treat him uh, in this way. So I object uh, to this particular question. Your Honours, the question does not seek expert opinion. It simply seeks to elicit uh, more information on an observation that the witness has already made. He observed that shells fell only when the planes are on the ground. He drew a conclusion from that. My learned friend is perfectly entitled to cross-examine on this point, but it's not a valid objection. Uh, Mr. Schamberg is entirely competent uh, and it, it is within his knowledge to reach conclusions on events that he is observing uh, for a period that lasted several weeks. If I, if I may briefly reply, uh, Mr. President, exactly this is the point. This witness is here not uh, to give us conclusions. That is something for an expert to do. So the word conclusion should not even be uh, coming out of the mouth of this uh, uh, witness. Actually, uh, if, if, if you ask me, Mr. President, uh, Your Honours, I wouldn't have a problem with this uh, witness uh, testifying as an expert, but then we should, of course, use the proper uh, method to that. Uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Schamberg does indeed, uh, or might indeed have the qualifications to, to be an expert, but he isn't. So we should not ask him uh, uh, for any conclusions, just the things that he has saw, has seen, or has heard that should be uh, in evidence.
President, I'd like to give the floor to Judge Cartwright to make clarification and decision on the objection raised to the last question by Nunji's Defense Counsel. Please uh, take the floor, Judge Cartwright. Thank you, President. Uh, the um, uh, Chamber uh, wishes to avoid any appearance uh, that this witness claims particular expertise. Uh, the prosecutor is invited to rephrase the question uh, along the lines, you said this in your diary, uh, on what basis did you make that statement along those lines? Thank you, Mr. Abdulha. Thank you, Your Honour. Mr. Schamberg, as directed by the Chamber, um, we looked at the passage. I'll read it again uh, so that we have it fresh in everybody's mind. Quote, shelling of the airport continues. Airlift supply planes for protection are unloading deeper into the military section of the airport. Shells fall only when these planes are on the ground, which means the insurgents must have a forward observer. So as directed by Harona, can I ask you, what was the basis for that uh, view that you expressed that insurgents must have had forward observers? that using some kind of a telephone or whatever, he, he is close to the can I, airport. Can I interrupt you? I'm sorry, Mr. Schamberg. If you can repeat your entire answer, we, we only just caught the last couple of words. So if, if I could please ask you to just repeat the entire answer. Thank you. I came, uh, I came to the, my conclusion that there was now an observer close to the, uh, the airport because in the past the shelling wasn't as accurate and, uh, and it made sense that over a several days that uh, they were getting, they were shooting closer and closer to these delivery uh, su supply delivery uh, planes. And so uh, if, if they didn't have an observer, then they were simply become, becoming better shots from a distance. And I don't think uh, that changes the slaughter that takes place. And that I witnessed. Thank you. And my final question on, on that, um, what effect, if any, did the shelling have on the capacity of the regime and its supporters to deliver food and aid into the city? It reduced the amount of supplies and, uh, and as as the insurgents, the, the Khmer Rouge uh, assault continued, uh, less and less food and other uh, other needs, fuel uh, was getting in, and uh, that's all it was. It was like it was it was like a noose tightening around uh, the city. President's Defence Council for Noon you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I was too late objecting. Uh, the answer came so quickly that um, I answered the question. Uh, so I would like to, uh, to, to frame it in an observation uh, and a request to the Chamber. Um, I think not only the prosecutor uh, should be instructed to phrase his questions in such a way 
as he would do to a, a witness. I think also uh, the witness himself should be instructed by your chamber uh, to answer questions uh, only to the, uh, to the effect that uh, what he has seen or what he has heard. Um, uh, although the, the, the question was, was, was framed according to your uh, instructions, nevertheless the witness answered as if he were an expert. Um, so I think um, there should be an extra instruction coming from, from the bench, from, the, from your chamber, to uh, the witness to refrain from giving conclusions or uh, to refrain from uh, give, making broad sweeping statements on the basis that, uh, of the things that he has seen in that particular period. Uh, your Honours, in response, my learned friend is entirely mistaken. Uh, every witness, every witness is entitled to give evidence on what they observed, what they saw, and ordinary people are entitled to draw, to draw basic inferences on the events they observed. This is not expert testimony, it is testimony by a, an individual who observed events for an extended period of time and is providing both his direct observations of those events and then his observations or inferences as to the consequences of those events. All of that is within his knowledge, all of that he witnessed personally, all of that uh, he has written about, and all of that is already in evidence before your honours. If, if I may quickly reply. The witness was offering testimony as to the effect of specific uh, Khmer Rouge conduct on the complete on, on the normal, uh, uh, law normal government or administration. That is not typically what uh, a witness uh, could offer as a, as a sort of reasonable inference from what he has been testifying. Clearly, this was a question uh, uh, to this witness packaged as an expert. So um, uh, it is allowed for witnesses in a very, in a very limited way to, to come up with a conclusion but not uh, in such a broad aspect of what uh, particular conduct had what particular effect uh, on the administration. Your Honours, two points. I think the objection is entirely unfounded. It now is amounting to a delay of time. My friend should be directed that replies are not permitted to objections. We do not reply to objections, and the same should apply to the defence. The prosecutor... President, we would like to remind all the parties clearly that the, a person appears before the chamber is a witness or an expert or a civil party. If the person is treated as a, a witness, then the, the questions put through that person should be treated as a witness and the question should not try to elicit the conclusion from that witness. And it is rather strange when the prosecutor raised this question. And of course, there have been several objections so far which have been ruled by the chamber regarding this very point and you should have been clear on that. And we also inform the witness of his obligation and right. And this morning we also stated that. And Mr. Sinischenberg, as a witness, allow me to remind you again, you must tell the truth that you have heard, have recalled, or have experienced or observed directly that is directly regarding the events put to you in the question by judges of the bench or any other parties. Now let me resume. Thank you, Mr. President, for those instructions. Mr. Schamberg, I'd like to move now to the events of the 17th of April, and we'll spend a bit of time on these events. If I can start first, 
with your descriptions of the, the soldiers that you saw. We have on the case file an article which was published in the Chicago Tribune. This appears to be a, a, perhaps a republication of, of one of your New York Times articles, but um, I'll, I'll read it and then you can tell us if this is, um, if these are your observations. Uh, this is document E3 slash 3368. Uh, it is a May the 9th 1975 article entitled Cambodians Flee Red Invaders It's Clear Some Won't Survive Only a brief passage here is of interest and it reads as follows American officials had described the communists as indecisive often ill-coordinated but they turned out to be determined trained, tough, and disciplined. Skipping one paragraph, you say the following, or the article says the following, quote, the troops we saw in the countryside and in Phnom Penh did include women soldiers and the boy militia, some of whom seemed no more than 10 years old. But all looked healthy, well organized. They were heavily armed and well trained. Can I ask you first, were these your observations uh, of uh, the Khmer Rouge? If you need a minute to find it, I can find it. Uh, I came to those conclusions by uh, mingling with these people on the way out of uh, Cambodia in a convoy. And we would stop took three or four days, and we would stop, and some food would be brought, and you could walk around and wash your face in the river or something, and uh, there was a lot to see, and my eyesight was quite clear, and those words come from me as a result. Thank you. Um, President, thank you. The time is appropriate for a short break. We will take a 20 minutes break and return at 20 past 10. Mr. Schenberg, the chamber will recess for 20 minutes. Maybe it's uh, late at night time for you over there but we shall resume in 20 minutes. Thank you. So I'm Jane Groucho.